Magandang araw sa inyong lahat and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I didn't proclaim martial law alone. Uh, it is made to appear as if uh, I, I just uh, signed the decree and said I impose martial law on each and every one of you. No. I ask the legislature to please pass a law proclaiming martial law because there was anarchy in the country. Now, uh, let me uh, say this, the opposition was strong and uh, they were members of the Security Council and somehow they adopted the resolution which uh, required that there be a unanimous vote for the armed forces to be able to move. And therefore the armed forces was immobilized. At the same time, I ask uh, um, the um, opposition party to come and join me in a coalition government. I offered one half of the cabinet and of course they laughed at me and said, why should we join you? We're going to take over the government. By the time you are through with the exercise, you're dead, politically and otherwise. <laughs> so, and they uh, refused to join uh, me. I asked the advice of the uh, judiciary. I asked the Supreme Court justices, the Court of Appeals justices, and the members of the private sector. And all of them told me there's only one man who can proclaim martial law, and that is the president. And you are it. You are the only one who can proclaim martial law. This is why I must carry this particular mark in our history. I could have I could not have transferred it to the legislature. Why? Because the legislature did not have the power. What does the Constitution provide? The uh, President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Philippines and he may order the Armed Forces out to quell any disorder, riot, rebellion, invasion, insurrection and in case of invasion, insurrection, rebellion or imminent danger thereof when the public safety requires it he may suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus or proclaim martial law throughout the Philippines or any part thereof. What does that provision provide? It provides that only the president can proclaim martial law. I repeat, that is why I had to assume a responsibility. And I am not one for shirking duty. The people said there was necessity for proclaiming martial law. And the people said, you are the only the official who can proclaim martial law. So I, hey, I proclaim martial law and I sincerely believe that it was necessary to proclaim martial law to install order and stability because there was complete anarchy throughout the country at the time. Now, therefore, uh, at that particular period, uh, what was the status of our government? Our government was immobilized impotent. The armed forces could not move out. The industry was uh, not at all in any way uh, um, moving. Uh, there was no income coming into government. Everybody was running away. They burned the U.S. Embassy, partly burned the U.S. Embassy, tried to burn it anyway. They tried to kidnap the American ambassador. American ambassador was by road, ambassador by road and uh, they tried to kidnap uh, our foreign minister, Foreign Minister Romulo, whom you just uh, um, saw today. And I told him, you better disappear because I will not ransom you. <laughs> but whatever it is, they burned the Manila International Airport, they bombed the Supreme Court, they bombed the Constitutional Convention, they bombed the City Hall, they burned uh, part of uh, Malacanian Palace, they attempted to uh, kidnap my children, they attempted to kill the President eight times. There was of course an attempted assassination against the First Lady, you all know about that. And uh, th this uh, uh, required that I immediately uh, act on it, and uh, so uh, I uh, did. Now. Um, we established uh, land reform. We were fighting a group known as the Hukbalahap, Hukbung Nagpapalaya Nambayan. It was socialist inclined. It was leftist. But uh, they were friends of mine because we had fought in the, uh, se in the Second World War together. And uh, so I approached them and I said, 
look, I'm going to establish land reform. If you are fighting for land reform against the feudalistic agrarian uh, system, then you must join me. And they did. I want to introduce to you the leader of that rebellion, who is now present and is a part of the government, Mr. Luis Tarouk. <laughs> he is a member of the National Assembly. The one, one reason why he ran to the hills, according to him, was he was elected as a member of the old legislature and he was not recognized as such. He and the others. Now I want to introduce to you another uh, leader of the Free Farmers Federation, which is uh, also composed of farmers who wanted reform, but uh, who are fighting for reform, but who are now joining in the effort to establish political stability and economic prosperity throughout the country, and who was dean of the College of Law of the University of Ateneo, but abandoned his deanship in order that he may join in the effort to attain the uh, noble mission of this new society. I refer to uh, as National Assemblyman Jerry Montemayor. <laughs> President, <laughs> President of the Federation of Free Farmers of the Philippines. I would like to introduce also to you a young man who uh, was very active against the government in 1972 and uh, who paraded around the streets raising the flag of, of the Communist Party and organized the Kabataan Makabayan, which is the red organization of the youth. And this man is uh, Nilo Taya. Is uh, he here? Anyway, he is uh, somewhere around here. But they have all joined all these activists to prove to you that all these stories about uh, our being oppressive uh, against uh, our enemies and our friends, they've all joined the government uh, to help uh, reform and uh, drive out all the corrupt people in the government. We have an ombudsman. We are the only country with an ombudsman. You know what an ombudsman is. He's the officer who watches over the uh, uh, corrupt officials of government. And uh, uh, this man has charged 1,000, about 1,000, more than 1,000 officers and employees and sent uh, most of them to jail. Uh, is Justice Pamaran here? He must be somewhere around. Uh, where's Justice Pamaran? There he is. There's the ombudsman. And we have, we have not uh, deprived anybody of private property. On the contrary, while we are a free enterprise society, we have an egalitarian base, we recognize private property, encourage private initiative. And our constitution explicitly recognizes the importance of developing the national economy and protecting the patrimony of the nation. In line with this, a National Economic and Development Authority has been created for the purpose of planning and coordinating economic development plans. I chair that uh, Economic Devel um, Development uh, Commission. Now, I did not come all the way here to recite these basic facts to you, but it is best that uh, we wrote this at once. For or, um, They form an important background of understanding the developments in my country. Relations between the United States and the Philippines now span, oh, I'd say 84 years if you mark the Battle of Manila Bay, 184 years perhaps if you mark the, the um, Brig Salem, uh, from Salem, which when it returned to Man Salem, brought back uh, what, hides, indigo, lumber, pepper, and paid 24,000 in tariff duties. Many things don't change, not even tariff duties. And <laughs> the trade between our countries uh, is covered by a trade agreement. The military and security matters are covered by three agreements. Those agreements are, and I will now ask our uh, friends in my staff to distribute these agreements to you or as many as can uh, receive them. 
These agreements are the Mutual Defense Pact, the Military Assistance Agreement, and uh, the um, uh, Military Facilities Agreement, which is due for review uh, this uh, coming year. President Reagan and I have uh, agreed with the members of uh, our cabinet that uh, the review will start in April, probably will finish it by August. Through it all, our relationships develop in a way unique to nations so disparate in size and circumstances and so distant from each other. The direction which American colonization took in the Philippines in the political, economic, and military cultural spheres were such that for us, relations with the United States would remain crucial for a while. It is said that language is the greatest conveyor of culture. If that be so, if that wise man who said that is right, then your language has certainly conveyed to my country your culture. And this is why the relationship between our country is something undefined. Our interests may have diverged in the period after our recovery of national independence in 1946, but this relationship has endured. And the question that is often asked is, does the Republic of the Philippines differ from the American Republic? Yes and no. It doesn't differ in the sense that it is democratic, but it differs in the sense that we have a prime minister and in the sense that uh, we uh, try and uh, make the legislature and uh, the um, uh, president or the executive work together. We cannot afford any stalemates. We cannot afford any delays. It is a modified presidential form of government while yours is a complete and pure presidential form of government. Why did we change this? Because we cannot afford stalemates and deadlocks. Yours is a strong economy and a military power. Ours is a weak country. It cannot afford to delay and postpone decisions pending the uh, debates between Congress and the President or the Prime Minister. The poorer third world countries cannot. And so, my friends, that is the situation. I am now going to ask also that my staff distribute to you the social and economic indicators of my country in showing to you the dynamism and the vitality of our economy. We have changed uh, our economy such that we hope to be able to be self-sufficient. We were importing rice before. The last time we imported rice was in 1976-77. We paid $500 million for that price. Today, we are exporting rice to our neighboring countries. And uh, the uh, per capita income was about $200. Now, it is more than $800 uh, per, uh, per capita income. The um, gross national income has increased five times. I need not go any further. I'll wait for the questions, and now I am ready for interrogation. Thank you, Mr. President. Please give us details on your meeting with President Reagan. Did you seek any firm commitments? Did you get them? Well, a firm commitment as to uh, when we are going to uh, re review the basis, yes. A firm commitment that a mechanism be set for the study of uh, our economic problems, uh, yes. Because, as you know, the reason we have a deficit in our balance of payments is uh, the commodity prices went down because of your uh, domestic deflationary policies, your interest rates. But all of this can be worked out. Uh, and so it has been agreed. So Secretary Reagan of the Treasury is going to meet with our foreign minister, who is also prime minister, regularly. The next meeting is uh, uh, next uh, November, I think. So uh, we have worked that out. The national... Uh, uh, security matters will be worked out by uh, the defense minister. The two defense ministers are also meeting in the November. Those are the specific ones. We have also entered into a tax agreement uh, and um, air agreement. This afternoon, tomorrow, there will be some kind of a, a, uh, agricultural agreement. As you know, uh, we have one of the most modern 
and biggest concentration of agricultural and natural scientists in Asia. This is in Los Banos, the University of the Philippines. And um, we have biogenetics, we have uh, plant uh, engineering, we have uh, name it. You remember that the International Rice and Research Institute is based there and that it was the one that produced um, the new uh, type of rice which produced the rice green revolution. And we help your scientists produce the uh, corn that uh, can fight mildew when your scientists could not produce it, we did. That uh, center is uh, going to be developed. We are also hoping to be able to exchange uh, technology on uh, uh, non-conventional energy and other uh, uh, matters. It has been reported that your government will seek two billion dollars in rent from the U.S. for the Philippine bases. Is this an accurate report? No, it is not. We have never talked about figures. Louder and clearer. We can understand the question. Uh, the question uh, was, is it correct that we have demanded two, million, two billion in the rent? The answer is no. We, we haven't quoted any uh, figure. What we have asked is this. We want a study. What is it that is necessary in order that we can perform our job? You and I know that if the Philippines is a top, the United States is not necessarily bound to immediately react because the provision of the Mutual Defense Pact is that you will immediately take steps as is necessary to meet the contingency in accordance with your constitutional processes. What does that mean? That means that you go to the Senate and the House of Representatives. What does that mean? That means delay while we are dying there. <laughs> Most of our allies in Europe concerned about resisting communism give the U.S. free bases and even share the cost. Why shouldn't we expect the same kind of cooperation from the Philippines instead of demands for more rent? Well, uh, for one thing, um, you haven't exactly uh, paid for what we lost in the last war. If we must make an accounting, 75% of our cities were devastated in the last war. We lost a million men. Shall I quote you the statements of Roosevelt and MacArthur that every carabao will be paid for? Shall I tell you that the veterans who were inducted into the USAF, the United States Armed Forces of the Philippines, of the Far East, your armed forces were paid only one half the salary of your soldiers. Shall I tell you that uh, we almost turned communists because you refused to recognize us? Shall I tell you that uh, I had a difficult time stopping my guerrillas, 25,000 of them from joining the communists? Because precisely, you, <laughs> you, you uh, sort of forgot that uh, we had done the fighting for you, you know, and uh, we were parts of your armed forces. But in fairness to the American Congress, when we came here and we called attention to the fact that we had been abandoned and forgotten, they themselves in outrage immediately passed the law, recognizing the services of the uh, Filipino and reinstating them as parts of the United States armed forces in the Far East including back pay and benefits. That, uh, uh, Madam President, is uh, the answer, in addition to the fact that uh, those people that you are talking about have uh, been making money at the expense of the United States for quite a long time, while we have not. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, U.S. bases in the Philippines could not be defended. Why should we expect that in another war these bases would be more reliable? That's one of the questions that I wanted to find out. 
Mag-subscribe at i-click ang notification bell para sa mga susunod na video updates. Maraming salamat po!